Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Functional Forum. Really excited to be here with all of you tonight. Uh, we have a great show lined up, really critical topic, co-creating immunity. And I have two giants of the space joining me this evening, both uh, from uh, just outside in, in Orange County, California. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about co-creating immunity, and we'll get into that uh, here shortly. Next month, there's actually uh, an, another innovation on this topic where we'll be doing a recap from a recent conference that I attended, which was a mitochondria, uh, mitochondria conference led by Dr. Andrew Heyman. It was really incredible and I've got all the footage in the can. I can't wait to share that. So that's coming up um, next month, December 4th. Definitely some overlap with what we're gonna be talking about here today because we are gonna be talking about co-creating immunity and what that means. Um, and, uh, you know, we are live tonight, so we've got two incredible, uh, incredible presenters. And if you go on to Twitter or X and use hashtag functional forum, I'll be following that along and I'll be able to put the questions uh, to my guests a little bit later. So um, if you want to participate live, you're more than welcome to to do that. Just want to give a shout out to all of the communities across the country, uh, the functional forum communities. You know, this was at one point going to be a live event in Orange County, California. Both Dr. McCann and Dr. Lundquist are um, participants in that community. In fact, Dr. McCann, even back in uh, 2014, 15, 16, um, ran the Orange County, California meetup and had um, all kinds of uh, get togethers with local practitioners. I remember speaking there once with like 100, 150 practitioners there. So it's really exciting to see communities um, starting to grow, starting to bud. I want to share one exciting community that has launched, uh, that is about to launch, which is in Johnson City, Tennessee. So if you're watching, if you've been following the podcast, I interviewed Dr. Uh, Michael Mabry the other day, and he is working inside a fully capitated uh, 100 doctor, 1,300 employee, 150,000 patient system, practicing functional medicine, getting great outcomes, proving the value of functional medicine inside a capitated system. He is actually going to start his own functional forum. And in the first quarter next year, we might making might be making a trip out there because um, we're coming up to the 10 year anniversary of the functional forum, which will be um, in February. So uh, stay tuned for that. I'm grateful as well to Rupa Health for sponsoring um, some of the biggest communities across the country and supporting us. I know most of you who are listening to this have heard of Rupa Health before, but they are organizing uh, some of the labs you're going to be hearing about tonight, some of the labs that are used in functional environmental medicine. Um, they make it really easy to do that. And so if you haven't got started with Rupa Health or if you haven't heard about it, um, take out your phone. You can use uh, this QR code and uh, get in touch with them and see what it's all about. All right, so how do we co-create community? And that's what we're gonna be talking about this evening. You know, as I'm thinking about the co-creation of immunity, I my mind can go towards, um, you know, the, the relationship that we have with our microbiome, the relationship that we have with our body, the relationship that we have with our functional medicine doctor, uh, the relationship that we have with other patients, and the relationship we have with our community. And maybe there's there's other ways that we could think about that. So um, let's welcome uh, Dr. McCann and Dr. Lundquist. Welcome docs, great to have you here. Super excited to, uh, you know, to to jump into this with you. And, and thank you so much for, for being uh, part of the Functional Forum. Dr. McCann, I wanna start with you because this weekend uh, I was actually attending a different conference in, in uh, San Antonio, Texas, but I, found out that the American Academy of Environmental Medicine conference was on, which you were attending. And I know, I think um, you're, you have a leadership position in that organization, right? Yes, I'm on the board and actually was part of the conference committee that pulled that whole conference together. So it was a labor of love and so exciting to be there. Yeah, well, um, yeah, like I, I came across town at the invitation of Dr. Derek Guillory uh, for Dr. Peter McCullough's talk. And honestly, I felt like it was a real breath of fresh air uh, for me. You know, I feel like when the Functional Forum started, we were definitely a little bit edgy when it came to, you know, really thinking about what's really happening in healthcare medicine. Obviously, there's nothing like a pandemic to, you know, uh, put people a little on their heels as to, you know, what's really going on. But, you know, I was I was super impressed by that presentation and the energy in the room. 
as first time I've been to an AAEM event. And so, yeah, I'd love to just hear, you know, your thoughts on putting that conference together. You obviously, you also had Dr. Joseph Ladapo, who I'm a huge fan of, who's the Surgeon General of Florida, and has actually probably done more to bring, you know, I'd never seen curcumin being recommended by a public health official before, and yet there it is on the state of Florida's website. So um, tell us a little bit about how you pulled the the speakers together and, and what anything you'd like to share about the conference. Well, the theme of the conference was how has your practice changed over the past three years? And for many of us struggling in, or, you know, practicing in functional medicine, it was a huge wake up call in how we had to really pivot and deal with the, with this complex illness, which has now become a complex chronic illness that Eric is going to talk to us about a little bit later. Um, but also the ramifications of not just the spike protein from the infection, but the spike protein and, and its impact uh, on health kind of across the board. So uh, we we knew that we needed to have specialists in cancer, specialists in neurology, as well as Dr. McCullough, specialist in cardiology, be able to show us the latest on the data. Um, and so it was a combination of science. And then, you know, what I'll get into a little bit too, a lot of people who have, have had issues with COVID, it's mast cell activation. And we'll talk more about that in my talk as well. Uh, Dr. Latipo and his wife, Brianna, were so amazing. Um, she is a healer and a therapist of sorts and has really helped him become more in touch with his own personal journey and healing. So we got to see not only the the politician, the physician, but a real human side of him and a spiritual side of him, which was so profoundly helpful to see. Yeah, wonderful. Well, I, I heard that's kind of what I heard about on Friday night at dinner. I heard how great it was. And that's when I was like, let me come over and see what's going on here. And I have to say, it was great to see you know, so many people that were there at the beginning of the functional forum, Dr. Jeff Morrison, I have so much respect for, um, and, you know, I've sent tons of people his way. Mm -hmm. um, we interviewed actually Robin Burzin a couple months ago, and she worked for, you know, Jeff for a year before she started Parsley Health. And I think that really, you know, made a big impact on her clinically. Um, and then, yeah, so many, like many other doctors that I've, you know, met along the way and, and um, have seen doing interesting work. You know, I wanted to actually ask both of you. So this this week on the podcast, we actually had a podcast with um, Dr. Joe Pizzorno. Mm. Dr. Pizzorno obviously has been a leader in environmental medicine. You know, he's been a leader in integrated medicine. He's like the original natural doctor and he's on the board of IFM. So he has all of these like credentials across these different areas. And I guess one of the things that I always hoped with the functional forum was that it would bring um, coherence and across these seemingly you know areas and you know recently i saw an op-ed that he wrote essentially calling for the, this new name which is health medicine and i guess i'd just love to get your thoughts on that um either or both of you um because i know you you know you both straddle um a couple of different names of how you practice and when I, I was just reflecting in my email on saturday that perhaps you know, now that I know what I know, I'm not sure if I would have looked to create unity, which is what the purpose of the functional forum was under the functional name, because ultimately I'm not sure if that is a unifying name. And I'd love to get your, either of your, both of your thoughts on health medicine and, and whether or not that resonates with you as a, as a way of bringing together, um, you know, this practitioner community into what we all hope will be, I guess, the new standard of care at some point. Go ahead, Eric. You want to go first? <laughs> sure, I'll jump in. I I think it's great. I think that uh, there are there are some challenges. I think we get the question all the time: what is, what is functional medicine? What is integrative medicine? I was speaking uh, with a neighbor this morning, and uh, she thought I was a psychologist, and I was explaining to her, "No, I did. I'm a family medicine physician, but I subspecialized in integrative and functional medicine. And she looked at me and said, what, <laughs> what is that? Yeah. You know, so I think it's still, um, 
not clear to people exactly what that means. They know there's a little bit of a buzz about it, but they don't know exactly what that means. Uh, as soon as you explain a little bit about what we're trying to accomplish, we're trying to get to the heart of the problem, we're trying to help people optimize their health, and ultimately it really is good medicine or health medicine or healthy medicine. Um, so I, I, I like that concept. I like that idea. I think that that's where we're moving um, away from this conventional medicine model, which seems to be uh, pill for an ill and we cut in, we cut it out if we don't like it. And that's, that's, we want to change the way that medicine is practiced with a more forward thinking perspective in looking at individuals and saying, where are you at now on the spectrum, health spectrum, and how can we get you to a much healthier space? Awesome. Yes. Right, what do you think? Um, I, I, I agree. You know, it's cumbersome to say functional integrative environmental medicine. <laughs> so, um, and um, Dr. Guillory actually had uh, a group of us do an IV uh, training workshop at his clinic uh, in San Antonio called Root Causes Medicine. And he gave us all shirts that said uh, real medicine. And he uh, changed the lettering of the ME in medicine. So it said real medicine is me. And I think it doesn't work on a play on words, but real medicine is we, right? So health medicine, real medicine, it's us, it's community. So figuring out a way to incorporate that, you know, we as the community, we as the patients and the practitioners working together and all the practitioners, not just the medical doctors, the acupuncturists, the chiropractors, the nutritionists, um, the physical therapists, like we all have to come together and help people get better. Um, so something like that would be great. Yeah. Well, that's still the dream, you know, 10 years into it, I, I, you know, I came up with the functional forum because when I saw the functional medicine, I guess, matrix, I, I thought, well, here's at least something that like practitioner teams could cooperate around, right? Cause you can start to see, okay, well, if this comes up with structure and function as the main driver of the pathology, then like, let's bring in the chiropractor but we don't need it for everyone. That was the, the way that I was thinking about it. But, you know, obviously some things are inside our control and some things are outside of our control and the, the you know, the industry has moved in different directions, but the goal and the intention of the functional forum was always to bring, you know, like-minded practitioners together. And um, yeah, on that end, you know, one thing I want to just ask you about Kelly, which I thought was super interesting that, that Dr. Uh, McCullough talked about is that, you know, tonight I'm going to have two doctors sharing like essentially their protocol that they're using with patients for certain things that are coming up and one of the things that i that he said that i really thought was interesting was just the lack of bravado from health systems touting their protocols for either covid long covid or, or anything else, like where is the Harvard protocol? Where is the Mayo Clinic protocol? And they just don't exist. And you know the implication of that to anyone who's in healthcare is like, well, what, what's actually happening here? Because in no other disease category does that happen. They're all very you know, excited about their, um, you know, their, their cancer protocol or their you know, heart, heart disease outcomes. And yet here's you know, the most obvious thing that's coming up and, and there's none of that. And I just thought, you know, that was actually a really good way of thinking about it because anyone who's in medicine knows that there is so much ego and bravado involved. And yet in this one topic, everyone's just sort of sitting at the back and being quiet. And I think that was a, you know, a tell, a tell for, you know, for what's happening. Absolutely. If we think about it that way, you can see the, the cognitive dissonance and the, and the, um, the brainwashing, honestly, the brainwashing uh, that has gone on because clearly there's something wrong, deeply, deeply wrong with the society and with medicine in general, if it's not going to do what it normally does, like actually use scientific inquiry and put the patients first. Absolutely. Well, look, I want to, you know, I want to make sure that we get the most out of our world-class experts tonight. Thank you so much for being on. So first up, Dr. McCann is going to give her uh, presentation here, and then we'll come back for some questions. Keep the questions coming in on X and Twitter, and I'll have a chance to give them to both of them. But take it away, Dr. McCann. Thank you.
All right, guys, let's see here. <clears throat> okay, it worked. <laughs> Fabulous. Okay, so I'm going to talk about mast cell activation syndrome because one, it's super, super important. And you may think that you're not seeing this in your practice, but I assure you that you are. And if you see long haul COVID patients, you are absolutely seeing it. So let's talk about what mast cells are. <clears throat> when I first uh, learned about mast cell activation, I had forgotten all about mast cells, um, but they are immune cells. They contain all of these beautiful packages we call mediators. And these mediators are predominantly inflammatory in nature. And the job of the mast cells is to... <clears throat> to seek out foreign invaders in the body and to release their inflammatory mediators, the cytokines and the chemokines, to stimulate a response. And so they are looking for infections, they're looking for toxins, um, and they participate in a whole bunch of IgE and then non-allergic disorders. If you don't remember, they are uh, born from the bone marrow. They are um, related to our blood cells. And so there you can see the mast cells here <clears throat> next to the, the white and the red blood cells. And um, they are, they make up a very small percentage, like less than 1% of the, the cells in the body. Um, they are born in the bone marrow, but they move then to the periphery and they line the areas of interface between ourselves and the outside world. So they line the upper respiratory tract, the lower respiratory tract, the mouth, the entire gastrointestinal tract, around the skin, they're in the brain, uh, they have a high affinity for the nervous system. Um, in fact, they're in every single tissue of the body except the retina. So they're in the connective tissue, um, and as I mentioned, the vascular tissue and nervous system tissue. <clears throat> and normal mast cells are supposed to fight foreign invaders, and so they're the first line of defense. But what happens is that in some people, they can develop what's um, called mast cell activation syndrome, where their mast cells have gotten dysregulated, and now they're dumping their inflammatory mediators at seemingly innocuous and um, things that we should normally tolerate um, kinds of exposures. And the, the definition is really, really important because you're going to see multiple systems involved, multiple symptoms, and these are inflammatory, sometimes allergic, sometimes they can be even related to growth. So lots of cysts, for example, and these patients are overly sensitive, hypersensitive. So it's really a dysregulation that's happening. <clears throat> Pre-pandemic statistics show that appro approximately 17% of the population, one in six people have mast cell activation. So that's one of the reasons why I say, I know that you're seeing it. Um, and then it's estimated that 75% of people with chronic health conditions likely have MCAS. And you don't have to have allergic symptoms in order to have MCAS. I have a number of patients who have persistent chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, chronic migraines with absolutely no symptoms of allergy, and they have mast cell activation. Um, and it's thought with uh, the advent of COVID that the rates of mast cell may even be higher. And the challenge is that the constellation of mediators that are in the mast cells is different from person to person. It's different in the same person from tissue to tissue. And so you can have a whole array of multiple systems involved multiple symptoms involved. And it, so it becomes very, very difficult to sort through the weeds of the, the review of systems that is all over the place with these patients. And that's exactly the key is that when you come across a patient who has all of these symptoms, think mast cell. These are just some lists of symptoms that I tend to see. Um, so if patients have a lot of symptoms after eating or drinking, for example, we often will think SIBO, but if it's happening immediately after, 
there's not time for the food to get to the bacteria and for gas to be created. It's really likely a mast cell problem. Um, POTS and hypotension uh, can be associated with mast cell activation. And we'll go through some of this. Uh, if I see a patient who comes in on an antihistamine that they just decided to take, if they have lots of lists of allergies to medications and supplements, they probably have mast cell activation. If they have chemical sensitivity, EMF sensitivity, uh, again, you want to think mast cell activation. This is the diagnostic criteria um, written by Dr. Lawrence Afrin and a group of us, myself included, call, we call it consensus two. And that's because there was a... <clears throat> allergy immunology group who put together a def definition criteria, diagnostic criteria for mast cell activation that is very restrictive. They use tryptase levels and an increase in the tryptase levels as, their, as pretty much their sole and primary diagnostic criteria, which is um, very exclusionary. And you're going to miss many, many people and allow patients to suffer. So this is a much, much broader uh, diagnostic criteria and you can access that article on um, it's for free on the internet, but these are really the highlights. The clinical const constellation of symptoms, you can also look at minor criteria which would inc include uh, CD117s for mast cells, either from uh, gastrointestinal tract, like if somebody's had an EGD or a colonoscopy or uh, genital urinary tract. Um, those are probably the easiest ways to get uh, a diagnostic criteria met. Whoops. Um, and you can do blood testing as well, blood and urine testing. <clears throat> The tests are a little bit complicated because the blood has to be chilled and run it in a centri cent uh, refrigerated centrifuge, ideally. Um, most lab cores and quests don't have refrigerated centrifuges, so it's difficult to do those kinds of testing at commercial uh, labs. I worked with my local hospital to be able to provide this kind of testing and most of the urine markers do get sent out. <clears throat> but we know now that there are thousands of mediators and you can see here we're testing for a handful of mediators. And so it's very easy to do the testing in somebody who is highly symptomatic and still get negative tests. That does not rule out the likelihood that they have this clinical condition. When we're talking about functional medicine, we always wanna make sure that we are thinking about causes. And these are the top triggers in my experience. Mold exposure, mold toxicity is probably the biggest driver of mast cell activation. Um, I also see a lot of Lyme disease, Bartonella in particular is one of those tick-borne infections that um, drives MCAS. <clears throat> chemical toxins have historically been drivers of multiple chem chemical sensitivity and MCAS allergens, foods, et cetera, EMFs, as I mentioned. And then also really, really important to understand the role of trauma and chronic stressors in the triggering and even as the kind of antecedents of setting someone up for being susceptible to mast cell activation. It's also important to recognize that there are quite a number of conditions that are related to mast cell activation. The hypermobility uh, patients are much more at risk for developing mast cell activation when they're in um, environments like a moldy environment, or they happen to get a, a tick bite. <clears throat> we also see a lot of dysautonomias. And so the vagus nerve autonomic nervous system is often dysfunctional in patients with mast cell. They have limbic system activation and they have all of these other symptoms. Um, additionally too, we see autoimmune conditions, gastroparesis and dysmotility issues, and then hypercoagulability. <clears throat> and Here's a pictogram that one of my colleagues, uh, Andrew Maxwell, put together. Andrew Maxwell is a pediatric cardiologist in the Bay Area who takes care of, of patients with um, 
mast cell activation and other related conditions. And so you can also see that there are some more serious things uh, such as cranial cervical instability, as well as tethered cord, median arcuate, arcuate ligament sim syndrome, all sorts of uh, endocrine disruptions, uh, pans and pandas, et cetera. Um, and when you start to think about these conditions, it just feels a little bit like uh, six blind men putting their hands on an elephant and trying to describe the elephant without being able to see the the entire picture of the elephant. Um, and so what Dr. Maxwell did is he put it together in a simple explanation where we think about this as the pentad, uh, where you see mast cell activation, dysautonomia, autoimmune, gastroparesis, and EDS syndromes. <clears throat> and then around these uh, pentad, you can then organize a lot more easily and structure it in your head as the, the related conditions. So now that you have seen these patients, identify that they have mast cell activation, plus or minus POTS, plus or minus EDS, what will you do? This is the same thing that we do in functional medicine. We find the triggers and we remove them and if possible, cure it. We uh, have to stabilize the production of the mediators and then interfere with the mediators release so that they will have less effect. And in many of these patients, it's extremely important to find the right combination of things and go slow because they are super sensitive. Um, and even if they... <laughs> are not yet sensitive. You can make people worse by pushing them. Uh, it's super important that you don't start with detox and like have them do chelation. You'll mess, you'll mess them up. Uh, it's not a good way to do that. So start one thing at a time, low doses, and then work up slowly. The more sensitive the patient, the lower the dose. I have patients who have to get compounded only prescriptions. They start out at the lowest dose the compounding pharmacy can do, and they will literally open the capsule and take pinches out. But eventually over time, they will make progress if, as long as you're willing to meet them where they're at. And that's super important. <clears throat> In terms of other things, um, I start with H1 blockers, H2 blockers if, if uh, able, and then you can dose these higher if they need it. Um, so you start potentially with a low histamine diet. Not everyone is going to benefit from a low histamine diet if they don't have histamine issues. If they have um, histamine intolerance, then uh, they're going to do better with a low histamine diet. Um, and you have that conversation. Do you want to do medications? Do you want to do nutraceuticals? And you have to work on nervous system retraining as well. And then just to keep your thoughts in, in mind, pay attention to removing the causes and the triggers. This is just an example of a low histamine diet. There are lots of them out there. Use that as a framework from which to start um, and make sure that the patients do it for a short period of time. If they see benefit, great. If they don't, you move on. And then we know all of these. So you've got your first generation, second generation, H2 blockers. Um, I find that most of my mast cell patients, uh, chromalin is a game changer in about 20 to 30%. If it doesn't work, move on. Uh, ketotophen, I do love. It uh, has to be compounded orally. Um, there is an eye drop that's available commercially that's good for some people with very specific eye symptoms. Um, LDN can be used. Leukotriene inhibitors can be used. Zoller can be used. Um, although I don't prescribe that, I typically refer to a an allergist for that. And then in terms of mast cell su supplements, there are, oh, <laughs> dozens and dozens. And so pick your favorites. Honestly, I teach my patients how to muscle test themselves because I have hundreds of things that I can give them and I can use my intuition, but especially when they're sensitive, if they have a tool that they can use to help guide the treatment choices for themselves, it helps tremendously because you're never going to know what, what they're going to do well with. Some people do fantastic with quercetin and quercetin has good research, but honestly, um, I prefer to use the things that the patients uh, tend to do well with.
Um, here's some more DAO enzymes. People will do well with um, when they have histamine intolerance symptoms and it doesn't do anything if they don't have a whole histamine issue in their gastrointestinal tract. Um, so those are some of the ones that I love. And here's a list. In, in, I, I did an online virtual summit last year on mast cell activation and then did the research on all the different things. And I think I came up with about 65 different uh, products that could be helpful for mast cell activation. Um, so there's a lot of options out there for you. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, it's super important to pay attention to the nervous system too. We will not recover their health if we just treat them with mast cell activation. Uh, patients need to calm down their nervous systems, which have gotten totally revved up because they are <clears throat> they've they've had medical trauma, they've been gaslit, and their nervous systems are on edge all the time. So vagus nerve stimulation and limbic system retraining are critical. Um, here's a list, not a full list, but here's a list of some things to consider for vagus nerve stimulation. The idea is that we want to get people out of fight, flight, or freeze to the parasympathetic uh, area or ventral vagal, which is going to allow them to rest, relax, feel safe enough to heal. And it's really this idea of safety that you want to uh, empower the patient to find. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in terms of limbic system retraining, we know the limbic system is part of the um, ancient part of the brain where we store memory and emotion, and there are a variety of different programs that do this. Um, the Gupta program and Annie Hopper's DNRS are probably one of the most famous, of the, the most famous ones. Um, more recently, I've really uh, appreciated Primal Trust by Kathleen King. I think she's done a great job of grabbing different pieces of information from all sorts of, of practitioners. Um, and, you know, the last thing I'd really like to say is um, these patients are not only sick, they are fearful, they uh, do not feel a sense of safety. And it's really up to us as the practitioner to provide a, a place where they can start to feel safe and start to heal. And so what that means then is we have to start to heal our own wounds, that we have to be present with them, heart, mind, body, and spirit. So thank you. Beautiful, I love that. Um, and yeah, such a good, good, uh, good message there, because ultimately that that is that, you know, there's so much going on. And uh, I really appreciate, you know, one of the things I know about you, Dr. McCann, is that I know that you end up getting patients who have been everywhere else. And, uh, and I'm sure for many practitioners, they feel like that because of just how far down the list these kind of treatments are. When I see things like Qigong and and other things in that list or meditation, you you know, you kind of wonder why this is at the very, very bottom of the list as opposed to, you know, primary care. And that was something that Gabe and I, um, you know, always used to talk about at the beginning of the functional forum is trying to find easy ways to, you know, help people facilitate those kind of things just because of the synergistic effect that it could have with, um, you know, everything else. And, you know, even to start to kickstart uh, healing in, in those areas. Um, how much of this, how much of these, these things do you do in, in your practice and, and how much of this do you rely on as of a network of synergistic practitioners in your community? You know, it really depends. The most important thing I find is helping the patient find the resources that resonate for them. Uh, mm -hmm. for some people, it might be a sound healing therapist that, that, tips them over. For some people, it's simply reading a book and starting to do their own internal work on themselves. Um, I hand people a long list, like these are all the different vagus nerve stimulation devices. Let's talk about the ones that might resonate for you. Um, let's talk about some other ways to do somatic experiencing or seeing an energy healer or working with a medical intuitive to help shift the blocks. I mean, <clears throat> what I find that's most important uh, and that I really want people to take away with is each patient has to develop their program, right? It's not 
Dr. Kelly's program. It's Amy's program. It's Jerry's program. It's Daniel's program. It's that patient's program. And they're going to pick and choose the different pieces and parts that work for them. And that's, what's going to help them heal. Yeah. Well, that reminds me, you know, I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago and and it was a reminder of the the three legs of the stool of evidence-based medicine. And one of those, one of those legs of the stool is the preferences of the patient. Mm -hmm. And so we have to, you know, really be asking about that and diving into that because ultimately the easier that we can make it for people to participate, you know, the more likely that it is going to work and and do the things that they want to do. So that's a great reminder. Well, thank you so much. Um, and uh, yeah, really appreciate uh, that, that I know this is happening or not happening to whatever degree, depending on, you know, the kind of practice that you're running and, and the kind of patients, I guess, that, that you're seeing. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, that it's a, it's a bigger conversation, uh, but yeah, I really appreciate, uh, you know, that, that guidance because you know at the 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 deepest end of the pool this is what patients are seeing and actually i wanted to share you know one of my um one doctor that i've had on a few times on the forum before dr christine burke who's actually my doctor you know she's one of the six trials trial sites for uh, the dementia reversal trial and you know one of the cool things about i was asking her about that was you know, when, when Dr. Bredesen first came out, he was tracking outcomes across all these different locations that were doing some part of his work. And he was able to identify these six clinics that were getting the best outcomes. Her average uplift in, um, in MOCA score is four and a half points, which is ridiculous if you understand that, that scoring system. And I asked her like, you know, what is it about her care that is, is getting it? you know, in that way, well, one is it's the foundation of functional medicine, right? To be able to see and treat the root cause. But she said, like, more and more, you know, that with these hard cases to unlock, a lot of times it's this kind of thing, right? It's mold. It's these, you know, it's these chronic inflammatory conditions. And so um, that was really interesting to me to see that, that, you know, the skill that it takes to unwind those kind of patients is this, you know, it can appear in lots of different ways. Um, but that's the key skill that gets her the great outcome. So that was uh, very interesting. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you. And uh, yeah, Dr. Lundquist, great to have you on here. And I think we're going to um, look at uh, something a little different here. So let's jump into your presentation and then keep the questions coming in and uh, we'll do some questions before the end. Thank you. Sounds good. As Kelly mentioned, uh, there, 2020 was a big game changer for us and how we looked at treating medicine and how we evaluated our patients. And as we thought, okay, we'll get through COVID, uh, within six months, we started seeing patients who just weren't quite resolving uh, from their COVID experience. And it became clear that there was a post-viral effect of the SARS-2 COVID uh, virus. And in fact, the, the WHO definition of Long COVID basically says that it's a persistence of symptoms uh, or initiation of symptoms three months after having a COVID infection or exposed to the uh, spike protein, um, and it persists for up to two months. And so this is now a huge problem that a lot of us are dealing with. And there's not a lot of clear guidance he, again, as we were talking about from some of the bigger uh, organizations, uh, there are controversial organizations that have come out with protocols and, and different ways of approaching it. And I think that their um, evidence is, is useful in how we, we treat and evaluate patients. And so my hope tonight is to give you kind of a brief clinical overview of COVID long haulers and how you might approach it. I'll give you a brief uh, case of uh, more of a mild uh, COVID. And, and I have I gave a talk to the naturopathic community uh, last February, and it's a, a much longer uh, version of what I'm going to share tonight. And I, I've given that video to James, and he can make that available for any of you who are interested in a little bit deeper dive. But let's start with just kind of looking at a, a case that I saw uh, who came to the clinic 
uh, after experiencing th that very thing, three months after she had had COVID and having treated it and, and responded fairly well, she's a very healthy, fit, 36-year-old woman. And yet starting in, in, in January after experiencing of 2022, after experiencing COVID in August, she, she was starting to get debilitating anxiety, debilitating heart palpitations. Uh, she, she was having uh, uh, several symptoms that were keeping her from performing at her best. She started having a lot of brain fog and fatigue and then having some gastrointestinal issues. And so she came into the clinic and uh, I do a medical symptoms questionnaire and her score was 77. And although her examination and her vitals were relatively within normal limits, uh, a heart rate of 74 for somebody who's really uh, fit uh, is a little bit higher. And, and it was mostly these issues of panic attack and heart palpitations and fatigue that were really driving her um, issues. And so I did a, a thorough investigation through a variety of hormone and immune labs and started her on some uh, supplementation with the, the goal uh, of, of using medication and uh, supplement therapy at calming down the immune system and starting to get her body to be better at self-regulating and moving into a resolving state. And one of the things that I love most about our, our practice is our ability to use IV therapy. And I used a high dose vitamin C therapy combined with glutathione uh, that really helped to kind of turn the corner with her. Well, after a, a few months, a, a few weeks uh, of treatment, she started noticing uh, significant improvements. Uh, she was still having some gut issues and some uh, brain fog. And interestingly enough, she started getting a, a rash and some, some neuropathy associated with that rash. And uh, But as you can see, her MSQ significantly dropped from 77 to 36. And uh, she had some abnormalities with some of her uh, labs but nothing that was significantly uh, outlandish. Started her then on uh, a more managed approach of trying to identify these different characteristics that we were going to target with her long COVID, continuing on certain treatments, and then working on her gut healing, and then trying to get uh, to some of the uh, heart of the ration uh, that actually should be sertrazine, not sertraline. I, I should have updated that, but but helping her um, on uh, some of the 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 mast cell activation uh, symptoms that Kelly just got through talking about. And by August, her uh, symptoms had completely resolved, and she was off supplements, and she was feeling much much better. But as you can see, this was a year now from the time that she had had COVID, and she was finally making some progress. COVID is uh, seemingly, or post-COVID long haulers uh, is seemingly hitting about two th a third to uh, even probably higher percentage of the patients. I just think there's a lot of it that doesn't end up getting reported, uh, but there's a high percentage of patients that are coming in. And CDC is saying there's close to 20%. And interestingly enough, the highest percentage is in the 36 to 50 year old age group with the least amount of post-COVID or long haulers from the younger population. Primary symptoms include this uh, profound fatigue. There can be sleep disturbances, brain fog, muscle aches, but we're also seeing some chest pain uh, and then neurological issues with uh, uh, altered taste, tinnitus, and now even uh, some neuropathy. And I, I'm going to share uh, a couple of studies at the end of the presentation that recently came out that help us better understand some of the pathophysiology. But this element of exercising, making it worse is really at the heart of post-COVID uh, syndrome and, and has to do with mitochondrial dysfunction, 
to the extent that patients literally will be worse after exercising. This was certainly experienced with this patient who was an exercise fiend, and she literally would try and get back into exercise and then uh, be debilitated the day after and shortly thereafter. And then uh, patients can also start to get better and then stress or exercise or mental activity uh, that is uh, significantly profound can also uh, contribute to that. And as Kelly talked about, none of these uh, things are um, a disease process in and of itself and isolated from others. And as you can see, there's significant overlap uh, with some of these chronic inflammatory response syndromes. And what we are seeing with COVID too is this immune suppression is then allowing certain chronic infections, uh, mold, Lyme, uh, EBV uh, to kind of reassert itself. And so that complicates things even further. And it's important to kind of remember that as you're treating your patients. So most of this is through clinical diagnosis, through history and, and physical exam. The, there's not much you're going to see on physical exam except for, you know, watch out for some rashes, unusual rashes, some vascular type rashes. Sometimes they'll, they'll complain of abdominal tenderness. And then, uh, as you'll see at the end, uh, there's some neuropathy issues that have started to materialize in some of these patients that are, are considered idiopathic until you start putting together their timeline and history. From a testing standpoint, uh, basically looking at making ruling out any other major uh, problem that could be contributing to this from a differential diagnosis standpoint. And then Quest has a cytokine 13 panel that I like to look at to look at Th1 versus Th2 uh, activation and imbalances. Uh, I found that vascular endothelial growth factor can also be a good clue with uh, a lot of my patients having elevations in VEGF early on in the post-COVID uh, and then it going to below normal as things go on. And as we all know, uh, COVID and now we're seeing post-COVID also uh, triggering the coagulation pa pathway in an abnormal way, looking at some of these labs can be very helpful. And I go into a much deeper dive in my presentation about those things. So what are some of the uh, overlapping theories then in terms of what's causing this protracted uh, response, the inability of the body to uh, resolve from having this viral infection? But one of the uh, theories is this activated pulmonary microphages uh, are not transitioning from their M1 phase to their M2 phase, which is a more pro-resolving phase. And so this leads to this persistent uh, organizing pneumonia, which is not something you're necessarily going to see on x-rays. It is almost like a micro pneumonia, but it leads to this uh, difficulty in um, oxygen uh, utilization. And although their, their SpO2 on measuring pulse ox will be, will be normal, they feel air hunger. They feel uh, like they're still having coughing and, and, and mucus production uh, well after uh, this initial COVID response. The persistence of spike proteins, it's this S1 protein that continues to activate these non-classical monocytes. And we see microglial activation in the brain. And this continued ongoing inflammatory response at a lower level than the cytokine storm that's seen in COVID causes this persistent unresolved uh, debilitation of the individual. And this is where we also see issues with patients who are developing a long COVID syndrome after just being vaccinated. It's because of the spike protein that's being produced and their immune system becoming upregulated and overactivated and, and just not getting into a resolving state. 
We know that the uh, COVID virus binds to ACE2 receptors and that there is this microvascular um, impact on the endothelium, which then leads to this microclotting. The microclotting leads to a fibrin deposit along the endothelial wall, which is then uh, leads to uh, poor nutrient absorption as well as oxygen uh, reserve in the areas that need it. This leads to a mismatch in the brain, a mismatch in the, the nerves, and we start seeing a lot of neurological symptoms associated with this uh, claudication, exercise intolerance. A lot of these things are from this uh, microvascular uh, inflammation and clotting. Spike protein molecular mimicry is likely leading to an, uh, an induced autoimmune uh, situation where we're seeing evidence of uh, positive ANA without really any other activation of uh, antibodies. And this, this is leading to neurological complications as well with uh, myalgic encephalitis and POTS uh, to be some examples. As Kelly just talked about with MCAS, uh, when you, with the COVID virus and with the spike protein, you get a stimulation of mast cells, which then releases pro-inflammatory mediators and leads to uh, leaky brain and neuroinflammation. And then there's this immune dysregulation where you're just getting an imbalance of Th1 to Th2 instead of uh, being able to manage and keep dormant these chronic infections, you get reactivation and you see a recurrence of multiple symptoms. Dr. Bruce Patterson, who actually has a long COVID immune panel, has identified this, that with elevations of interleukin-8, it actually is demonstrating that those individuals are almost always identified as having an up uh, a reactivation of, of mono or, or Epstein-Barr. So let's take, take a look at uh, a couple of studies uh, that, that have come out in the past year or so. This was one in uh, the neurology, um, uh, neuroimmunology and neuroinflammation journal. And it was interesting, they looked at 17 individuals who had long COVID and what they found was that there's a, a predominance of small fiber neuropathy in these individuals. What was interesting, that, and the reason I came across this is my brother uh, at, our, at his we a wedding of his daughter this past summer fell and had been really struggling with this neuropathy and had been, he was just telling me recently that he had been to six different doctors, uh, multiple specialists. And nobody had been able to identify his the cause of his neuropathy. And when I did a timeline, he had COVID last November, and his symptoms started about six weeks after COVID and had progressively worsened and now persisted. And, and that's likely what his current case is. Now, interestingly enough, they're finding that uh, these small fibers are uh, vulnerable to environmental stressors, including uh, immune dysregulation and toxins. And they found when the toxic conditions improved that they, they found improvements in uh, axonal regrowth and the ability to re innervate and resolve symptoms. Uh, out of these 17 patients, there were four treated with IVIG and uh, 10 treated with corticosteroids. Uh, and all had some um, improvements. There was one who resolved without any intervention uh, over a course of nine to 12 months. Uh, and so they, they came up with this theory that uh, these viral, um, it, it's not so much that, they, that there was a, uh, a persistent virus, but that the immune system was not... Um, turning off. And when they did an autopsy of these post-COVID patients who had neuritis, they found this persistent maculofodular infiltrates, as we were talking about earlier, 
and that they were these M in the M1 state, meaning they're in the pro-inflammatory state, but that they really couldn't find any evidence of viral impact um, localized in the, the, the nervous tissue. And so this suggested this disimmune uh, response and that this is likely uh, consistent with other things that we've seen uh, in the SIRS um, realm. And this one just came out this last month in a cell and is a really interesting uh, uh, look at how a reduction in serotonin levels is playing a significant impact in the neurological symptoms and the, the perpetuation of long COVID. And this is a very interesting study. They, they uh, uh, basically looked at 1,500 individuals who had post-COVID, and they looked at different biomarkers. And as they were looking at amino acids in individuals who had had COVID and then in post-COVID patients, and then in uh, patients who had had COVID but resolved and didn't have long COVID, they were looking for any kind of consistent biomarker. And what they found in that group was that tryptophan was a common uh, biomarker that reduced serum tryptophan levels in, were seen in acute COVID in all individuals, but in those individuals who were exhibiting long COVID symptoms, they were still having a suppression of their serotonin and, and tryptophan levels compared to those who were not having long COVID symptoms, their serotonin levels had re, uh, responded and rebounded. So this led them to investigate further and they hypothesized, well, the only way to decrease serotonin is to either decrease tryptophan uptake through the gut uh, or to increase serotonin breakdown through uh, the uh, uh, metabolic pathways, MAO, and, and into the kinetic pathways. And so they looked, and what they, what they found when they did small animal studies is that the primary uh, instigating factor here was the gut. And as the viral RNA was binding to the TLR3 receptors in the in the gut uh, monocytes and macrophages, it was releasing interferon. And what they found with interferon is that it, it was binding to the alpha receptors on these enterocytes and blocking the ability for the enterocytes to absorb tryptophan. And then this had a significant deleterious effect on the body and serotonin in particular has a big impact on the vagus nerve, which we were just talking about. And that they believe that a lot of the neurological and neurocognitive effects are likely associated then with this drop in serotonin and a dysfunctional vagus nerve. Certainly makes sense going back to our first patient who is having these anxiety attacks and heart racing uh, symptoms, which are a sympathetic overdrive, there, there just wasn't adequate vagal tone to be able to compensate for that. And despite doing uh, mindfulness and uh, vagal stimulation type exercise, if there's not enough serotonin, you can't get the vagal nerve to respond. So this was this is a really interesting uh, study from that standpoint. And platelets, interestingly enough, absorb serotonin. And if they're depleted with serotonin, they're not going to be able to circulate serotonin to the body. And so as part of their study, they looked at using SSRIs in a, a mice model, and they found that they were actually able to restore uh, vagal function and serotonin levels, which then resolved some of these neurocognitive effects, improving uh, memory and, and other cognitive deficits. So very interesting study in, in looking at how part of the problem and part of the sequela of uh, long COVID is being impacted. Again, I go into more details in my discussion, uh, but this at least gives you an idea of different things and, and, and the different theories and how to kind of look at treating post-COVID patients 
Uh, really, we're trying to get them from this pro-inflammatory state to a pro-resolving state. And there's multiple medications and supplements that can be used to help with that. Uh, we want to um, also help to promote serotonin restoration. I've used fluvoxamine uh, with some good success there, as well as SAMe and uh, 5-hydroxytryptophan. And then looking to try and decrease uh, the platelet release of VEGF and then clear out uh, microfibrin uh, or microclotting with the fibrin products. And then just helping in the other MCAS and POTS symptoms that are, that are happening, and man happening and managing with these patients. All right. Well, that was a mouthful, but I'll go ahead and end there and uh, take Great any there, questions. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, I guess one question um, that, you know, you mentioned clearing the spike protein there. And obviously, you know, one of the strategies, you know, or the main strategy here in, in uh, over the last three years was to stimulate the body in different ways to consistently create spike protein. Like that's the plan. So how do you think that plan's going? Not very well. It's not. It, 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 it's a problem. And I think for those individuals who are more prone genetically and from an environmental standpoint, their susceptibility when they get the spike protein, whether it be through a vaccine or through contracting COVID, they they have a rough time. It's It just does not go well. And they may get to a point where they're not as sick as they are through the acute phase, but we're just seeing so much debilitation in what what were healthy individuals before you combine that now with these individuals who already have Lyme and mold and other things, it's it's just devastating because they may have made progress. And I talk about this in my my longer presentation of a of a woman who had made significant progress in her SIRS and then boom got COVID and it just was a huge setback. Yeah, I heard that from uh, Dr. Elroy Bajdani, who has an incredible practice and treats mm -hmm. a lot of autoimmune, you know, conditions and just, um, you know, whether it was around the first course of the vaccination or the booster or whether it was around, you know, reinfection, just seeing like so much progress that he had made with autoimmune patients and that sort of relapse. I mean, Dr. McCann, I mean, you've been treating this exact patient type for more than a decade, like very clearly as the as your practice focus i would say there's probably almost no one better to give us a, a feedback loop as to what you've seen in the last three years as far as the people that you've helped regain function and what's happened you know in those cases you know i i really do think it's multifactorial um you know whether somebody is healthy like the case that you're presenting eric Clearly, there was something that was not quite right underneath it, but it got unmasked. And I think if we think about it as an unmasking of genetic predispositions and nutritional deficiencies, anybody who exercises a ton, guess what? Your, your lymphocyte map through Cyrex is going to look like dog do because you're pushing yourself too hard. So these people that our ultra marathoners often look much, much worse immunologically than people who are moderate exercisers. So I think it's really important for us to do prevention too, right? So now we're seeing all these long haul COVID patients. Um, I, I have to admit, I've had very few long haul COVID patients. My worst one got COVID in March of 2020 and she was mold exposed and had Lyme disease and we had gotten her pretty well. And then COVID devastated her because I didn't have any of the tools, right? I didn't have anything that I could offer that offer her, but slowly over time, you know, some, it was thiamine, it was mitochondrial support. It was qui quieting down the mast cells. It was doing all of these things. Uh, lots of um, lipid therapy. So lots of phosphatidylcholine to help heal the cell membranes. Um, and with other patients, um, 
it's it's really been about looking for those other infections. Do they have chronic sinus issues? Do they have mold exposure? Do they have a chronic infection like Lyme disease? Um, so thinking about it really simply, it's toxicity and deficiency. Those are the two things that we have to look at. And if we have deficiencies, because now you have this huge burden of oxidative stress, you have to manage that oxidative stress. And if you have toxicity and oxidative stress, you have to manage the, the nutritional deficiencies. And so sometimes the only way that you can get on top of that is IV nutrients, IV ozone, IV phosphatidylcholine to really help bring people back into balance um, and think about all the things. Um, I do a lot of work up now preventatively for um, hypercoagulability. I have a whole panel that I uh, look at at Quest or LabCorp looking for genetic predispositions. I will tell you that I have found <clears throat> probably 85, 90% of my patients do have a genetic hypercoagulable risk. Uh, the most common one is actually plasmalogen activator inhibitor one, which is ironically not on the clotting side, it's on the fibrinolytic side. 85, 90%, that's a huge percentage of our patients that have genetic uh, hypercoagulability. So it's not surprising that we're getting the fibrin deposition and the microclots. Um, so some of my thoughts. Well, I'd love to just just wrap up here and ask you both a question as it relates to some of your own unique you know, unique areas. I mean, one of the things I know, Eric, you have a, a pretty significant practice and have other doctors that you work with. And in that context, you know, in your practice, you have a sort of a, a back and forth that you have, right? You have a community that you develop there. And then obviously, Kelly, you were central to building, you know, that meetup in Orange County. And, you know, that that's been, you know, taken forth in the last few years, you know, by mm -hmm. other people. And, you know, I, one of the, you know, one of the things, obviously COVID put a big um, wrench in the dream to have people, you know, practitioners being in room together and learning from each other. But now that we're sort of back in a situation where, you know, where that's possible again, you know, I, I, I know that being in community has really kept a lot of providers in our space sane over the last four years because they're able to really connect with other people to say, hey, are you seeing this? Are you seeing this? And, you know, being able to have that kind of conversation. And I guess I just love to, to you know, if we're talking about co-creating immunity and you've laid out some incredible information tonight, thank you, you know, both of you. But just to, you know, what is it going to take for this to sort of permeate into the hearts and minds of more uh, practitioners and, 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 and other doctors and, and to, you know, continue? I feel like community has a big role to play, whether that's inside a large clinic or whether that's inside, you know, a zip code. Well, one of the things that we have been doing is uh, inviting the family practice residents here at the residency program in Temecula, and they've been rotating through our practice. And it's been really fun to watch their reaction as they get exposed to integrative and functional medicine, this this broad spectrum approach, this whole holistic approach to patients that allows them to take a deeper dive. And just, it's almost like the light bulb goes on and they see, oh, as we were talking at the very beginning, this is healthy medicine. This is good medicine. This is best practice medicine. And they get so excited uh, and literally uh, want to come back and do another rotation. And I think that's the, the power of community and sharing is when you feel like you're on an island and you don't have the ability to share, you're, you, you wonder if you're getting too out there a little bit. But when you talk to other practitioners and you hear these stories that they're experiencing in their practice, you see that the change that's happening in their patients, the hope that has been given, it really, really makes a big difference. And so I think any opportunities that we get to have collaboration and uh, sharing is really important and valuable. Beautiful. Kelly, how, 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 what's, have, have you, uh, I don't know whether you're showing up to those events anymore, but like, do you, is that still an important part of your, uh, your week, your month, your quarter? 
Yeah, we're doing it quarterly now and I definitely show up whenever I can. Um, I love those um, forums to interact with other practitioners and I think it's really good for the community in general. Uh, you know, I also do think that staying affiliated with our um with our professional organizations like IFM, um, the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, for those of you who don't know about it, um, is a fantastic uh, professional organization. It's been around since 1965, right? So this is one of the oldest professional medica uh, uh, organizations out there, and they teach um environmental medicine, which is critically important to understand how to get some of these sick, sick patients better. Um, and then there's the International Society for Environmentally Acquired Illness. I happen to be on the board of both of these professional organizations, so I am a little biased. Um, but ICI, the uh, International Society for Environmentally Acquired Illness, has their annual conference this coming weekend. Um, it's a virtual conference, so you can attend from anywhere. And um, we're focusing on mold. So if mold is something that you need to learn more about, that's another way to do it. And it's a fantastic organization and great community building there. And I think the more that we can come to places like Functional Forum, do our local forums, um, and then hopefully start to interact with our more conventional colleagues who may have an opening, somebody you meet in a yoga class that you see in the grocery store um, that is a professional colleague, hopefully we'll start to be able to um, build that rapport with our uh, other professional colleagues. Absolutely. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you for being here today. And I, I guess I want to share this evening, I want to share, you know, uh, coming up next month, uh, I went I went last month to uh, this mitochondrial conference and Dr. Andy Heyman gave the uh, introduction and it was, he actually taught for a whole day. I think Richie Shoemaker had like an hour, but Andy Heyman was up there for a whole day. And he did something in the first hour that was really incredible and probably the best that I've seen in my time here, which was essentially, you know, going through the history of vitalism in America, right? Going all the way through all the different versions of vitalism that were, you know, in the 19th century and all the different types there. And then talking about now, essentially, our ability to measure the mitochondria and mitochondrial function, and particularly as it relates to not just the way that the mitochondria functions inside the cell, but the way that the mitochondria in different cells function together in a sort of a you know, an energetic field, you know, one way or another. And, and what he did that I was so excited about was what I, I think that he really showed that this might be the thing where like the, the, the amount of communication and the orchestration between the mitochondria, um, that, that could be, you know, if that could be now a way to measure and really understand at a very deep scientific level you know, what we call, you know, vital force and chi and prana and all these other things in the in vital areas. And it was really exciting because obviously one of the biggest things that I think is hard to get uh, across to doctors who are trained in, in science, you know, scientific discourse, you know, is the this concept of vitalism that is this anathema and you don't know what it is. And, you know, I never heard about it and I don't know what it is. But if these two worlds were able to merge through the context of measuring mitochondrial function and through very sophisticated measures, I mean, we're talking about, uh, you know, some of the, um, you know, some of the sort of uh, epigenetic markers and that, and that kind of stuff. So like deep science, you know, I, it was just very exciting for me because I felt like, um, you know, that, that there's potentially a, a pathway for alignment and agreement and obviously those of you and i put two of you in this category who have gone like above and beyond times 10 to really understand what's going on in the very cutting edge of this you know to then be able to like take a few steps back and say okay here is a unifying framework and if you come from the scientific end you can measure the mitochondria and if you become vitalism you can understand that this is what's been understood by the ancients and boom we have a unified thesis for how the immune system is orchestrated and how we can measure whether or not it's doing that well. And as I heard that presentation, I was like, we got to get this out to people because it was, it was, it just made, it just spoke to my heart in a way that was really clear. So I look forward to sharing that with all of you and um, 
I'm sure that uh, you know we'll get some great feedback from the community. Thank you both for your participation this evening and for your dedication to your patients and for taking time to share with your peers. It really means a lot and I uh, look forward to seeing you both again very soon. Thanks everyone for tuning in. This has been the Functional Forum. Uh, I'll see you next December 4th with what I just shared. Uh, hopefully that was a good um, good setup for what we're going to talk about next month. And then, uh, and then 2024 is right around the corner. I'm sure that's going to be a lot of fun for everyone. So.